me uh, pray for us. Get going. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, once again for the opportunity uh, to come and um, uh, look at the, the doctrine of Antichrist from the beginning of Scripture to the end, but now as we, we start to hone in on the, uh, the specific passages in the New Testament that um, seem to deal with this figure or um, political movement, whatever the, there are so many different interpretations, Lord, but we, as we, we turn our attention, we want to um, uh, see what, in particular today, Paul was talking about to the Thessalonians, uh, and uh, reflect on what we looked at in the Old Testament last week, so that we can uh, have a, a, a better understanding of what this Antichrist figure is, and how we, today, uh, are to stand at the very least against the spirit of Antichrist, and then uh, should we be here on this earth when um, uh, Antichrist with a capital A arises, we uh, pray that we would remain faithful and be ready for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so for those who uh, weren't here last week, here is your summation. Uh, but this is, this is going to help us uh, continue to get this this picture. If you remember, um, for those who were here last week, I talked about just like the doctrine of Messiah is revealed progressively in Scripture. It's called progressive revelation, um, where you have a picture, uh, but then with each prophecy as history progresses, uh, more of that picture is is colored in, or more of the puzzle, if you want to switch metaphors, pieces of the puzzle are given, so that when Jesus shows up and the religious leaders don't know him. He, he really is surprised and angry at them because the picture's there. Uh, there's, how, how did you not know this? Well, though the Old Testament does not spend nearly as much time developing the doctrine of Antichrist uh, as it does Christ, and understandably so, it doesn't mean that it doesn't uh, uh, develop it. And so it began with the seed of Satan. This is at Genesis 3, uh, where you have the Messiahs or the, the seed of the woman who ends up being Messiah, but all of the godly would fall under uh, that, that um, the umbrella of the term seed. And then you have Satan and his seed, which would be um, uh, that which is set against all things that are godly. And so you have this development in Scripture of these two seeds, the seed of Satan against the seed of, uh, of God, and um, uh, they're just going to do battle in various ways throughout history. So you have uh, an emergence very, very quickly with the city, uh, what we'll call the city of man, but uh, this turns into to, uh, uh, to Babel and then Babylon, etc., etc. But the city of man um, is, is really any kind of man-centered, human-centered worldview that opposes the kingdom of God. And so um, you see this start to, to play out in three, three types in particular, three types of the coming Antichrist. You have Nimrod, you have Pharaoh, and Nebuchadnezzar. So each one um, represents the city of man. In their case, it's a nation state. And the nation state uh, oversteps its bounds by assuming the place of God. So you have Nimrod, for example. Do you know what um, uh, Nimrod, you can start to read about him uh, in uh, Genesis 6 and, and on, um, and certainly after the flood, uh, but his name is there. Do you know what city he founded? Early on in Genesis, that becomes uh, the, the, the very symbol of uh, man's hubris. This is early, hint, hint right before Abram. <coughs> being built, probably like a ziggurat. Babel. Yep, right? So Babel. So he founds Babel. He's known as a mighty warrior, uh, hence the name Nimrod. Um, uh, but he, um, he sets up this tower to try to build a name for himself, a name for humanity. Uh, he um, is in the line of what will then become the Canaanites. And so uh, Nimrod uh, really represents in many ways a shift in the seed of Satan. 
the seed of Satan is now not, not just people who will uh, attack other people, Christians, but the seed of Satan now it shifts where you have designated figureheads of a nation state who are starting to oppose the people of God. But the colors of the picture uh, become uh, kind of more vivid as we turn to Pharaoh. Pharaoh's a, a clearer example. Now there were many, many, many Pharaohs, right? Um, but I'm talking uh, the Pharaohs that come in uh, to the picture once Israel, um, or the, the, uh, the Jews, I should say, the Hebrews, are uh, there in Egypt. And uh, certainly the time, uh, the Pharaoh, when, when Moses comes to lead the Exodus, you have the whole plagues, war going on, uh, where God is quite literally waging war against the gods of Egypt. Uh, the various plagues are, are actually direct attacks against the deities of Egypt. Um, Pharaoh being one of those deities, which represents a shift, a further shift. You go from hubris to deification. And so, but you still have the nation state opposing the people of God, oppressing them through slavery, and then, no, I will not let you go. You have Pharaoh's magicians who, for a time, it's a short time, but for a time, they, they're able to keep up with Moses' miracles. They're actually right, God working through Moses. Now, we talked last week that some interpreters think that it was sleight of hand that they were using, uh, others, and, and, and I, I can't quite go with the sleight of hand. I think it was demonically inspired power that they had, perhaps with some sleight of hand thrown in, but I don't think it's just sleight of hand. So, uh, but then God finally says, enough, enough of the counterfeit miracles. You can't go any further, uh, whereas Moses continues to go further. So you have Pharaoh, you have these demonically inspired counterfeit miracles, um, all meant to oppress the people of God, where God himself finally has to intervene, not only through the plagues, but you would think after, you know, killing their gods, from the frogs to Nile to the firstborn, and the plague of darkness, you, you killed Ra, right? Ra is probably the god that you all have heard of, uh, the, the sun god. God kills them all, Pharaoh still says, I'm going to go after them, and it takes, it takes God drowning them, right? Um, to, uh, and, and if you remember, such a cool scene where the, the pillar of fire goes from in front of them to behind them, mm -hmm. so that they, the Israelites, can get across mm -hmm. uh, the Red Sea um, without harm, and then it moves, Pharaoh and his chariots go in, and the rest is history. So that's God actually now, in a very visible sense, it's called a theophany, an appearance of God, um, uh, waging war against this God king who's oppressing his people. That just kind of, it, it continues with Nebuchadnezzar. Um, Nebuchadnezzar uh, now is in charge, fast forward in the Old Testament. Uh, what's his major city? And it becomes a place of, Babylon. yeah, Babylon, Babylon. right? So Babylon is going to, to become the, like the city itself is, is an actual place, right? Kind of down in current Iraq. But it's, it's more than an actual place. It takes on a greater um, uh, role in scripture where uh, Babylon the Great is fallen, the whore is down. You know, it, it's, it's going to represent in many ways the city of man. Um, but you have another figurehead who is uh, um, certainly thinking he is as powerful as, uh, as God, sets up statues and uh, people are to bow down to the statue of his image. So you have really the same themes. It's absolute hubris, deification, bow down to me, I will oppress the people of God. Now, if, if you were to um, go to uh, one person we, we touched on but we didn't spend time on. He's not in scripture, but he's, he's very clearly in history. And at the time of Jesus, uh, Jesus very much would have known uh, of him and, and the Jews would have known of him. Um, he came in, see if you remember his name, he um, was a Seleucid, that is one of Alexander the Great's generals, because Alexander the Great died too young to have heirs. And so the kingdom of Alexander was divided amongst his four generals, Seleucus, 
was one of his generals, and the Seleucids uh, then take over um, uh, what we, we know as Israel, and then the Greeks are defeated by the Romans, and on and on. But under the Seleucids, um, you have um, a guy come in, and do you remember what he did? In fact, let me give you the name, and you tell me what he did. His name is Antiochus Epiphanes, which means manifestation. Antiochus, the manifestation of... Now, what do you think... Do you remember the story? Does anybody know the story? He sacrificed a pig in the temple. He sure did. He sacrificed a pig in the temple of God. He did it in the name of Zeus because he believed that he was a manifestation of Zeus. Um, so Antiochus Epiphanes, manifestation of Zeus. So I am Zeus. I mean, think about this. You know how the Jews were to revere their temple. God set up very specific laws. We're not in the new covenant yet, right? So they're still under the Old Testament theocratic law. There is, a, there is a court for the Gentiles, right? Beyond that, if you're a Gentile, you don't go any further. I don't care if you're a king. I don't care who you think you are. You don't do that. You certainly don't go into the Holy of Holies or anywhere near it where any of the altars are, just the holy places, right? You don't do that unless you are, not even a Jew could do that. You had to be the priests in the Holy of Holies. You had to be the high priest. So he goes in because he's the leader, takes... Uh, Food which is not kosher, which is banned, and then he slaughters it on the temple itself in the name of another god. I mean, this is the height of blasphemy. This starts off the Maccabean War. So um, if you have an old Catholic Bible lying around, you'll see Maccabees in there, First and Second Maccabees. Um, uh, that, it, it's not that it's historically inaccurate, so it's actually a good source, and thankfully we have other sources that elaborate. Uh, it's just not inspired text. Jesus never refers to it. The apostles never refer to Maccabees. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we can't learn from it. And I think some of the other parts of the, uh, the Apocrypha, as my, my first pastor used to say, uh, Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, uh, there's all kinds of things too. Uh, but, but Maccabees is history, and, and it's good to look at that. And it's during that period. It's during that period, 167, 168, I forget the exact date, B.C., is when this happens. So this is the desecration of the temple, the abomination. When Jesus mentions that, this would have been not the fulfillment, uh, Antiochus, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, but another type. Someone who will now walk into the temple itself and claim to be God and make sacrifices, which are clearly false. So keep those themes in mind as we now turn to a specific text. And I'll read that for you if you can't see it. So this is now in 2 Thessalonians. Now, by the way, just by way of reminder, how many times is the actual word antichristos, antichrist, used in the New Testament, in the original Greek? Do you remember? How many times in the book of Revelation? Zero. That surprises people. It does not appear. It doesn't mean that the antichrist isn't there, and that'll be the next two weeks. Right? That's the dragon, beast, false prophet. And so, is he the beast? Is he not the beast? Is really what it is. Um, uh, so, he may be in Revelation, but the word is not in Revelation. They all come in John's epistles, where John talks about the spirit of Antichrist. How they have gone out from among us. They were never really one of us. And what they were doing, the reason he calls them Antichrist is because they were denying that Jesus Christ had come in the flesh. The churches to whom John was writing. Um, it's a group of people called the Docetists. And, uh, but there are, there are, it's not just that particular heresy. It's, it's any denial of Christ, any shape-shifting, if you will. I'm going to take Jesus and reform him into something else. Um, Paul has zero tolerance in all of his letters. And John would have as well. But Paul has zero tolerance for any other gospel. To the point where he says, if anybody preaches another gospel, even an angel from heaven, uh, then the one that I've declared to you, let him be anathema, let him be cursed. So that, that strong language from Paul is right in line with John's teaching that people who endorse heresy regarding Christ and, and all of scripture, um, by extension, are um, the lowercase antichrist. It's the same word, and there really is no capitalization in the original language, but for our sake, 
That's the lowercase a antichrist. Now the question is, is there a capital A antichrist figure coming? Because every time it's used, the actual word, it's, it's in what we'll call the lowercase form. Now before I even move on, do we deal with the spirit of antichrist today in the way John was talking about it? Not an actual figure, but figures, anybody, leader or someone like me or laity or whatever, teaching false doctrine in the church, in the church. Do we deal with that? Yes. Yeah. Yes, we do. Are we the first generation of Christians to deal with that? Mm. By no means, right? This has been right there all throughout church history. So um, give me, if you will, rack your brains. Um, it can be anywhere from church history to something you heard yesterday that, are, that a, a pastor said. Uh, hopefully, gosh, it wasn't me. Um, yeah. But um, something that you would say, you know what? This is not just an area of disagreement. This person has stepped off the rails. <coughs> or as a professor of mine used to say, he's outside of the pale of orthodoxy. Um, uh, but can you think of any heretical teachings that pop that have popped up over time that the church has dealt with? Any of the health and wealth preachers yeah. that we have. <coughs> now, because I'm interested in your very spiritual reflection, elaborate while I eat. That would be great. No, I'm kidding. Health and wealth. Actually, that is very present and but, but seriously, please elaborate on that, because that's important. Sure, there's uh, several preachers on, on TV that have watched them or read about them. And they, uh, you know, usually they're the, the larger churches, more popular churches. You know, very uh, uh, speakers, very, um, uh, they really seem to know what they're saying, and, and they, they, they revert to you know, the Bible all the time. And they talk about if you follow Jesus, you're gonna, he will, he will bless you, which is true, but it's not a guarantee. But they seem to come across as a guarantee. And so it's always tied up with money. Yeah, yeah. The health and wealth yeah. is very yeah. much tied up with money. You give me a thousand, and God will give you ten thousand. You gotta sow that seed, though, right? It's, it's yeah. it, there's that biblical language. Yeah, sow that seed of faith. Yeah, if you did, they got enough too. If you doesn't do that, you didn't have enough faith. Right. <laughs> You can't beat those guys. So, my good friend from um, from Zimbabwe, who moved over years ago and interned with me from the seminary, etc. When we were talking about, when I was first getting to know him, uh, I'd pick him up at the seminary, drive him to the church, and that was our chance to just chat and for me to show him around. And I said, oh, here are all these, I said, look at this church here. These are, this is called your town common, your town green. I go through all these little New England towns, and I'd point out the church. And I said, look at the flag that it's flying, you know, some Unitarian or rainbow flag or something like that. I said, chances are once upon a time that was a, a thriving evangelical church. But here's what happened. And I took him through the history of liberalism that came in. And he had heard of that, but only really heard of it. And he, so he kept saying, what, what do you mean by liberalism? And I said, liberal theology, you know, versus people's political views, they may be older than that, but I said, I'm talking specifically theology, not Christ and the Bible and all that. I said, do you not have that in Zim, uh, Zimbabwe, he called it Zim. Do you not have that in Zim? And he said, it's there probably, but that's not our big problem. Health and wealth is the big problem. Mm -hmm. Because we are a very poor country, which they are. Um, not doing much better, but a little better now that the man they affectionately call Bob is out, Robert Mugabe, um, their dictator. But um, it's not much better. It's still, it's an oppressed, it's like Haiti, it's like all these people, right? You just have bad leadership and it just rapes the land. Mm -hmm. So um, he said, think about it. If you're poor and yet somehow you have access to television, because most people do, that you, can, you can even find it in the bush, he said, you just, or your radio or whatever it is. And you want to improve yourself, there's someone telling you, we're still a Christianized country down there, not a huge Islamic influence uh, in the south of Africa. So we're Christianized, at least there's a veneer on there. Somebody comes on who may even look like you in terms of skin color, uh, but, but certainly is telling you, in the name of Jesus, you can look like me. Mm -hmm. And you can have what I have, a jet or whatever it is, mm -hmm. if you have enough faith. So he said people flock to that when God doesn't bless them, and you are exactly right. You must not have had enough faith. So that destroys your faith, throws you into all sorts of spiritual doubt and depression, while they get rich off of 
your lack of faith, quote unquote. And he said that just throws him deeper into poverty. <laughs> but the one church that popped in that is right on the edge of, I call it health and wealth, but it, it, it brings some other dangerous teachings in, um, that still attracts people. Uh, it's a very popular movement today. Many of us probably sing their songs, and I'm just as guilty, some of the songs I've sung. They're, they're undergoing a series of sex scandals right now based out of Australia. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Hillsong. Hillsong, Hillsong Church. Hillsong Church uh, is based out of the Pentecostal uh, movement. Um, and um, what's the guy's name? Is it Brian Houston? Yeah. Is that the head guy? Um, he inherited it from his dad. Um, but all the Hillsong churches you see are, are really in existence because the Australia Corporation has planted them. They're not autonomous movements. It's under us, the uh, Brian Houston, who had to resign recently because of sexual misconduct. And the one in New York City was just blasted um, by that guy's sexual misconduct and, uh, and folds. And it's just, it's awful. But it's the celebrity church. It's the church where Justin Bieber went. It's the church where Kevin Durant went, uh, which may explain why he just lost to the Celtics, right? Uh, but, um, but seriously, it is, and, and you know, it, it's the church where, where these people go. And so now if a celebrity goes to your church, I can be just like that. And, and my friend Gordon said, these pastors who've been faithfully ministering in, in the quote-unquote bush, which most of Zim is, you've got Ferrari, which is the capital, and then bush. And so they're, they're faithfully missionaries and indigenous pastors for decades, um, trying to have people come to know Christ. New flashy church in Harare, he said they will walk or jump on some beast of burden for hours to go there, hear it, come back. These, these pastors are now, they have no congregation. And then um, you're not going to get rich in Harare as a church, um, feeding off of the poor. And so they come in, and then eventually they pull out. These people are empty. This pastor's out of a job and may have relocated. Now they have nothing. Mm -hmm. So he said, we have a, those of us who are evangelicals do not like uh, health and wealth, but for them specifically, it was Hillsong. Mm -hmm. So that's there. What else? Give me one or two others from church history, heresies. <coughs> There's a man named uh, Albert Schweitzer. Mm. No to, relation. To whom I have no connection. <laughs> <laughs> My grandfather was very enthralled by him and tried to make the family connection, but unfortunately couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so in the late 1800s, he was... Uh, very gifted man, um, a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. There's a, a hospital in Africa still named after him. Uh, a gifted musician. I forget what instrument he played, but he performed with world class orchestras and a theologian. Mm -hmm. But he he started what people now would call the first quest. Well, he, I don't know if he personally did. Maybe you know more about him than him, but was involved in what we now call the first quest of historical Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Late 1800s and. And basically, you know, that was a time period when the Western civilization, we were so smart that things like miracles clearly couldn't have occurred. So we kind of went through the Bible and edited it. And, and what you're left with was maybe, you know, a, a well-meaning teacher who wandered the earth and has some good ideas, like a golden rule to follow life. But that's it. Yeah. Because intelligent people, of course, would believe in supernatural. So it's really science was... Science became the queen of the sciences. Right, <laughs> right. No longer theology, so somewhat of a turning point. We just had, what, two or three quests for historical yep. Jesus since then? And you're exactly right. He's kind of the father figure of that, um, and there are there have been others, but that don't overlook that. This whole quest for the historical Jesus, you know, mm -hmm. the bigger umbrella, you know, it, it's an extension of liberal theology, but it's it, it's it did a lot of damage and continues to do a lot of damage. I believe Schweitzer was one of the guys... Um, I, I believe he was. Um, you also had people like George Bernard Shaw and Carl Jung. Um, they, guess who was a, 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 their candidate for Antichrist, the capital A Antichrist? Paul. The Apostle Paul. Yep. Huh. And here was their rationale. Now, I think it was Schweitzer, but definitely Jung and George Bernard Shaw and, and uh, Rudolf Bultmann may have been in there. Um, because Jesus, after stripping away all of this extra stuff, 
What Jesus really taught was the golden rule, how to be a vegan. Um, that, so the gospel of veganism and um, uh, a couple other things about being nice, you know, golden rule. Uh, and so Paul, with all of this justification language and scary language about the end and all of that, uh, shows that Paul is using rhetoric to control people, to set a who's in and who's out uh, uh, set of categories. Um, and that is so far from the original teaching of Jesus uh, that if there ever there was an Antichrist, it is clearly this guy. So, interesting. Um, it sounds like it might have been a Jewish view, actually. Yeah. In order to discredit Jesus. Right? Um, it very well could have been. Yeah, I mean, it very well could have been. I, I, it's, it's, it's a plausible theory to at least explore, right? Um, uh, you could go on and on with Gnosticism and uh, how that manifests itself today and paganism in the, in the church. I was talking to a pastor uh, the other day um, who served in a, a former, his former denomination, um, dealt with liberalism, and we talked about how one of the Presbyterian, the PCUSA, Presbyterian Church USA, um, had communion probably 15 years ago now um, in the name of Sophia. Sophia is the feminine noun, um, the Greek word for wisdom, and uh, in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, that Jesus would have referred to and would have known. Uh, Sophia in Proverbs 8 is wisdom is personified. Wisdom proclaims in the streets. Well, instead of seeing that as personification, no, 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 that's a feminine deity. Because wisdom is speaking. And so there must be a fourth member of the Trinity, and we're going to have... What I, and what is that word? I keep stumbling. If there's, a, not Trinity, but what, is it Trinity? What would be the word? Somebody, uh, I'll, I'll give you the rest of my yogurt. If you can figure out that word. Um, but there's, there's the fourth member. And um, uh, they had, um, because when you go into the land, uh, it's going to be flowing with, that was the communion element. Milk and honey. Coming from a woman, it has some sexual overtones to it, very feminist uh, push, uber feminist, um, and not a single reprimand from the denomination. This was at a general assembly meeting. This is the highest court of the PCUSA. Uh, my former church, my first church was in the PCUSA at the time. They are no longer <laughs> in the PCUSA. Uh, that was not the final straw, but let's just say that that came close to breaking the back. There were other things. It just got worse from there. So I was talking to this pastor about it, and he said, I'm very familiar with that story. He said, isn't that just paganism? I said, it's straight paganism. It just slap some sort of God on there, you know, Christian God, and it's paganism. So it's all there. So now, let me turn to, to so keep all those things in mind as Paul now in uh, Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2, has this to say. <laughs> now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, this is the second coming, right? We ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way. For that day, the day of the Lord, will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness, now keep him in mind, is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God, or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, so now this is probably referring to the first letter uh, that he wrote, uh, and also when he was there to help plant the church. Um, I told you these things, and you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed uh, in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, there's that already not yet distinction. So somebody's coming, but it's already here. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, with all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. All right, so 
quick review of those uh, camps that we looked at a few weeks ago. Just in terms of this man of sin. You have preterism, um, historicism, dispensationalism. Both of these are, are probably um, premillennial. This one definitely is premillennial. This is a broader category. Um, will Christ return before the millennium? That's what pre means, or post, or whatever. Preterism is that prophecy is already fulfilled. Everything was fulfilled in the first um, century uh, and ended with 70 AD, the destruction of Jerusalem. And then the only thing not fulfilled in the book of Revelation is the return of Christ, is what preterism is in a nutshell. And then there's uh, reformed amillennialism. Um, so they look at this specific um, prophecy of this coming man of lawlessness. And they believe, the preterists do, that this prophecy is already fulfilled. It was Nero, he's the man of lawlessness who was coming, which um, historically, so far as possible, because uh, Paul is written in uh, uh, 50 to 50, or Paul, uh, 2 Thessalonians is 50 to 51 AD, um, uh, Nero is, is going to really shake his tail feathers, um, we'll look at him next week, and he did a lot more than shake his tail feathers, but... Um, when you read Nero, uh, I, I will challenge us to try to find any difference between Nero and what we're seeing in America today. That's my concern. It's not so much the politics. It's, it's the culture and how it's becoming incredibly pagan. But Nero's a figurehead, but we're still seeing it. Um, so at any rate, they believe it's Nero um, or Caligula or any of these kind of lesser known. There were a few in between uh, Nero and Caligula. Um, historicism, they believe that it's the current pope or the papacy. And so to a, to a person, the reformers uh, and, and the early Puritans believed this. They believed that because um, they held to the Westminster Standards. And so you pull out the Westminster Confession of Faith. Uh, you pull out the Savoy Declaration, which is the Congregationalist version of that or the London Baptist Confession, which is the Baptist uh, version of that. Uh, great, fantastic document. This is codified. That's in there. The Westminster Confession identifies the, the papacy as the Antichrist, right? The man of lawlessness. Dispensationalists, once they come on the scene in the mid-1800s, they say, no, this is a future Antichrist. It's an actual figure that's coming, uh, not just an office. And... Um, and this is one of those uh, areas where actually Amil, um, which believes in a millennium, just not a literal thousand years. It's not that we're against the millennium. We just don't believe it's a literal thousand years. We also believe uh, that the prophecy is future. We, meaning myself, I'm not speaking for everyone in, the, in this church. Uh, the prophecy is future, and we actually line up with the dispensationalists in that we believe it's a future antichrist, but we believe that what he will do and the timing of his arrival, that's where we're going to part with the uh, dispensationalists. But we both believe he's future. Something is restraining him in this text. So if you go back, um, verse 6, and you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he's out of the way, and then he'll be revealed. So there's questions about this restrainer. Preterism believed it was the Jewish commonwealth of the Roman Empire. That is, um, uh, the Jewish commonwealth was still in existence, uh, meaning the temple was still in existence, or the others would say, well, it, it's really Rome. They both serve the purpose of stopping people from worshiping the one true God. But once the, sac or the temple was destroyed and no more sacrifices, um, now the, the gospel... Um, not only does it go further, but um, now you're going to have Rome start to deify itself. So they believed that this commonwealth was almost a restrainer and was put in place uh, until it was destroyed, thus paving the way for Rome to deify itself. Because not every emperor believed he was a god. You actually don't see that until Caligula. Um, and then, then it takes off from there. So while Jesus was alive, the, uh, the emperor did not believe he was a deity. But by the time the apostles start to write their letters, 
that switch had happened in Rome because Caligula comes on the scene um, and he rivals Nero for being just as foul and disgusting. And so um, that's, that's the view there. I won't spend time why I think that falls apart, but still. Um, historicism, they believe that it's the preaching of the gospel uh, that restrains the evil one. Um, and you can, you can see that coming right out of their context, right? It, what, what did Paul argue with Rome over? Justification. There were, some, there were other things, but that was it. The gospel. The gospel. And you're preaching a different gospel. But you look so much like you are of Jesus. And so you have this, think of, you know, they went out from among us. They, they were a part of us. They were a part of us. But, man, they were wolves in sheep's clothing. They were preaching not just differences on baptism and the charismatic gifts, some of these secondary issues. This is the gospel, right? So that is why the historicists believe as long as the gospel is preached, um, then the papacy will be kept in check. So goes the argument. For dispensationalism, what's keeping the Antichrist from appearing um, is the Holy Spirit. And once the Holy Spirit um, is, uh, uh, decides not to restrain him anymore, then we'll see this figure appear uh, on the world uh, stage. For the Reformed Amils, uh, they believe it's either the angel of Revelation that, that is mentioned um, in uh, Revelation 20, um, or it's the providence of God, or the preaching of the gospel, probably a combination of all three. Um, so it's not that different than historicism. It's really the gospel. Then, um, what is the temple of God? Because that is in verse Four, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God. Is this the actual temple or is it something else? The Preterists believe that it was referring to the Jewish temple um, because they believe everything was uh, fulfilled in 70 AD. And um, for them, the person that would go in and take his uh, seat in, in um, uh, the temple of God was Titus. Titus was the Roman general who marched in and uh, raised Jerusalem to the ground. Uh, so for them, it, it's, it's Nero, succession of emperors, in partnership with Titus, who actually went into the temple itself. So goes the argument. Um, the Amil and the historicists are going to say that the temple uh, refers to the collective people of God, Jew and Gentile, who believe in Jesus. Whereas dispensationalism uh, says, no, since this is future, temple means temple. Um, remember their hermeneutic. Always separate Israel and the church. Always separate the things of Israel, the temple, and the church. Right? So the temple is not the church. The church is not the temple. Since the temple has not been rebuilt since AD 70, um, if you are familiar with any dispensational teaching, left behind or anything, um, that's what they're waiting for. Once that, once that first brick is laid, right, and there, there's, there's rumor, there's rumor that there's a quarry, and the, the stones have already been dug out, and it just has to be sent over. Do you know where that quarry is? Indiana. Really? <laughs> Go figure. Um, so why Indiana? I have no idea. Um, I, I just thought there was, like, corn in Indiana, but I guess there are rocks there, too, I suppose. Um, and then there's a red heifer and all sorts of lore that goes with this, right? Okay, great. Here's what's going on. Let's set the context. And uh, let me just switch for a second. Oops, let me come back. You are supposed to stop. All right, good. Don't worry, I know you won't be able to read this but I'm going to read it for you, just the highlighted sections, but I'm going to make it as big as I can. So this is from his book, and uh, um, Kim Riddle Barger's book, and don't worry, I'll just read this. Situation. This is what Paul's dealing with. In Acts 17, 1 to 9, we read of the Apostle Paul's tumultuous time in the city of Thessalonica during the days when a Christian church was first established in that city. So Paul didn't plant all of the church that he, churches he wrote to. He did plant this one, or helped to, uh, to plant it. As was his custom, he goes into the local synagogue. He reasons with the Jews from the Old Testament. 
He tries to convince them that Jesus is the Christ. A number of Jews are persuaded, but then the trouble begins. It's not long before rioting breaks out, if you remember the story from Acts. Paul and Silas are forced to flee to neighboring Berea. Eventually, they make their way to Corinth in Acts 18. The two Thessalonian letters were likely written in AD 50-51, shortly after Paul settled in Corinth to help the struggling but faithful church that he had left behind in Thessalonica. So Paul formed this church, but because of the rioting, he was forced to flee, so nobody was able to teach them. Right? So he writes these letters. He did leave some people behind, but he didn't really have a chance to, to do much. 1 Thessalonians is a response to a report from Timothy, who does stay behind, while Paul's second letter is a supplement to the first. It is in his second letter that Paul speaks of an ominous figure he called the man of lawlessness, who is also known as the man of sin, depending on your translation. This figure is understood to be Paul's sole reference to the Antichrist. As for Paul's discussion of this evil individual, some historical background is necessary. Now, I went through some of this, but this will flush it out. According to the Jewish historian Josephus, and I think you've heard of him, he was a contemporary of the apostles, not a Christian. He was a traitor to the, he's Jewish, but he's a traitor in the Jews' eyes because um, he worked for Rome. All right, but his writings exist and they're very, very helpful. So according to him in AD 40, the Roman emperor Gaius, more popularly known as Caligula, attempted to set up his statue in the Jerusalem temple, so that's in 40. According to Josephus, Gaius, quote, took to himself, or took himself to be a god. Therefore, this maniacal act is connected to emperor worship and the imperial cult, the worship of Rome and the, and the emperor. But it never came to pass due to the timely intervention of King Agrippa. And that seems to have been the case. Agrippa realized, as um, Riddlebarger says elsewhere, that this would simply be flicking matches into a gas can. Don't do this. You want the Pax Romana? This is not how to keep the Pax Romana, right? This will, this, don't do it. So, according to Josephus and just history, um, uh, Gaius backed down, thankfully. However, his attempt to such, set up such a desecrating image would have been seen by our Lord's disciples, many of whom were still in Jerusalem at that time, 40 AD, as a potential fulfillment of our Lord's warning about the abomination of desolation, standing where it does not belong, Mark 13, 14. Certainly this act of sacrilege would have been in the recent memories of both Jews and Christians when Paul came to Thessalonica and proclaimed the gospel, especially when the apostle warns the Thessalonians in his second letter, don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction, he'll set himself in God's temple, etc. They, they have this fresh in their mind. Not only do they remember Antiochus, but now somebody very current they remember, oh, Caligula did that, all right, or tried to do that. When Paul speaks of a man of lawlessness setting himself in the temple, no doubt some thought of Caligula's image. They certainly recall the Antiochus Epiphanes. Um, uh, since Paul's discussion is clearly framed against the backdrop of Daniel's prophecy of an end times enemy, an antichrist, if you will, who will attack the people of God, both from within, Daniel speaks of smooth words, and without, he will destroy and annihilate the people of God. The first critical question faced by Paul's interpreters has to do with the identification of the man of lawlessness. Paul's Thessalonian readers clearly knew what he meant since he reminds them, don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? While Paul's readers had the benefit of Paul's personal instruction regarding these matters when he had been present with them, the matter is much more difficult for us. We don't know for sure what Paul told the Thessalonians, but we can make a pretty good guess based upon the contents of his two letters. Down here at the bottom. In his first letter, Paul had spoken of his work being hindered by Satan. And in this very chapter that we are looking at, Paul speaks of false reports that the day of the Lord had already come, which were circulating throughout the church, deceiving many. Given such hindrance and deception on the part of Satan, Paul very likely told the Thessalonians that the secret power of lawlessness was already at work. But the apostle also encouraged them that God was restraining such evil until the proper time, which was the time of the final judgment. Therefore, the Thessalonians should not be taken in by such obvious falsehoods as they were hearing. All right. You have this um, 
you, you have this fledgling church. There's teaching going around um, that starts to pop up. When will the day of the Lord come? If people die before the day of the Lord, will they miss it? And that's when Paul comes in and says, no, 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 you'll see them again, right? Because the dead in Christ will rise. So Paul's answering questions, but there, were, there seemed to be a couple people in the church who were teaching that the day of the Lord already had come. That was Paul's biggest. The first was really a pastoral question. Um, if, you know, if Aunt Susie dies because she's sick and Jesus hasn't come back yet, um, but she believes in Jesus, but she's, she's going to die, day of the Lord, is that only for me or whoever's alive? Um, or will I get to see Aunt Susie again? So that's a, that's a, that's a hard question. That's a, it's not a hard one, but it's a pastoral question, right? The second one uh, was now dealing with false teaching. The day of the Lord had already come. It had already happened. So, um, the, uh, so Paul wants to, to address this, right? And he introduces the idea of this man of lawlessness who will come. So, um, when you get to, he talks about when he comes, um, for that day comes, that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And then the man of lawlessness is revealed. So this rebellion, let me go to it, sorry. The ESV and most, the one I just read, and most translations call it the rebellion, but the Greek word is apost apostasia, apostasia. The word that you see in there is apostasy. So it's, it is a rebellion, but it's specifically an apostasy. Now, with that said, let me go uh, back to the writing because he, he points out a few things here. And go to full view. All right. Um, the apostasy. As for the rebellion, the word that Paul uses here is used throughout the Septuagint. That's the Greek translation of the Old Testament, right? And elsewhere in the New Testament to speak of a religious crisis of some sort facing God's people. A falling away from the faith in some sense. As Beale, that's uh, uh, Greg Beale, um, former professor, Nathan's former professor, he's now at Westminster Seminary. As he points out, such a meaning is apparent because of the immediate context of false teaching. Verses 1 and 2, 9 and 12, 9 to 12. And the clear allusions to Daniel's prediction of an end time opponent who will bring about a large-scale compromise of faith among God's people. This seems to connect Paul's concerns to both John's and our Lord's warnings about false teachers and people who claim to be believers, but who fall away and take a number of followers with them. Now, some dispensationalists have erroneously argued that apostasia can mean something like a departure, so that Paul is speaking here not a departure from the faith, but of the rapture. They think the man of lawlessness will not be revealed until the rapture occurs. So it's not rebellion, it's not apostasy, it's rapture event. But as he points out here, uh, the word apostasia never bears that meaning. Um, the word means a rebellion against God, specifically an apostasy, a falling away from the truth on the part of God's people. Thus, professing Christians, not Jews, must be the ones who fall away. While there were some apostates in the apostolic church, just as there are in ours, God restrains false teachers and antichrists from gaining the upper hand until the appointed time. So, what Paul is saying is, look, the man of lawlessness, Jesus won't return until the man of lawlessness appears. And the man of lawlessness will not appear until the apostasy happens. And this is not good news. Now, in a very real contemporary sense, because they had a few people in the church saying the day of the Lord had already come, that was a form of apostasy. So remember that now and the not yet, right? And you even see it uh, in the text where it talks about, you know, even, even now there's lawlessness. But the man of lawlessness will be in the future. So there's this now not yet tension. The Antichrists, we're dealing now with the spirit of Antichrist, but the capital A Antichrist is coming. Well, 
Apostasy is the same way. Apostasy was there with these, these guys uh, that were denying the faith and certainly promoting false teaching. Um, Paul elsewhere refers to um, uh, Alexander and Hymenaeus, two men, two men who shipwrecked the faith, um, but they were in the church. Jesus and Paul and Peter and John in their writings, they have no room for false teaching. They are railing against it all the time and warning. Well, that's all apostasy. We went through some of the heresies, uh, just a few, uh, but this is always there. There's an always already sense of it, but the final apostasy, which is, um, it's scary. It's going to be a mass turning away from the faith within the church is the argument that, that I'm convinced of. Uh, I don't think it means rapture at all for the reasons he states. Uh, I think it is, it, rebellion is not a bad word as long as we understand that it's a rebellion in that sense. And it shouldn't surprise us because this is what we're seeing. And it seems to, I mean, when you look at, again, Ligonier Ministries and Lifeway have done these studies now for, oh gosh, a couple decades, I believe it is, at least 15 years, um, of self-professed evangelicals, not the common American public, right? And these are evangelicals of all stripes, uh, but still, they, they put that name upon themselves, and they can't give correct answers to basic Bible questions. Is the Bible the Word of God? Is Jesus the Son of God? Is He the only Son of God? The only way to be saved? What we would call basic Christian theology, they have all sorts of goofy answers. And uh, we're seeing it today in um, very... I, I was... Talking to my dentist, of all things. Uh, my dentist is a believer. That's hard to do. Uh, yeah, it is kind of hard to do. <laughs> Thankfully, he does it before he puts the baby cane. Um, but he always checks in, and he goes to a, a Four Seas church um, up on the North Shore. And he's in, he, at this point, he's probably been a believer for ten years. But you know, he still checks in on me, and he, we're about the same age. And um, I said, "Hey, just be be careful." I saw on your Facebook page that um, you had someone speak at your church. I, I know that person very well. And, uh, you know, she had given a testimony. I said, just be careful. Um, she has fully embraced the worst of wokeism. And it's, it's there's, there's not a lot of positive in my mind with wokeism, but, but the, we'll say the worst of it in terms of just goofy ideologies, social justice type stuff. Um, I said, just be careful. Uh, what, what she said, I know the, I hear it through a certain filter. Uh, but I know he, he had already been complaining that some of the elders in his church, and he had been one of them, were embracing wokeism. So that's why I brought it up. But we're seeing this um, throughout the church. There's a current phenomenon that's going on that just breaks my heart. It's this very public deconversion of the faith. When, when big-named people leave, um, usually Christian musicians at least are the ones, uh, but sometimes it's a writer. Um, what was his name? Josh Harris? Yeah. I kissed dating yeah. goodbye, right? Yeah. They decide to make their story known through social media as opposed to just having these personal struggles or walking away quietly. It's this public thumbing your nose. I didn't realize this apparently back in 2013. Um, he's one of my favorite singers. Do you guys know who Derek Webb is? Do you know Caveman's Call? Yeah. The lead singer of Caveman's Call, who also went on to write a lot of songs with uh, Indelible Grace Music, which I love and listen to. His name's Derek Webb. He was married to Sandra McCracken, who was um, with Cadence Call, etc. Well, he divorced her and left the faith and was very public about it and wrote many albums about that. Okay, God, goodbye, goodbye for now. But then he leaves the for now. And you just go, oh, now you're writing music about it. You know, it's just, it's sad. And I know that's just three or four people, but that has such an influence. And it's the whole, it's the whole idea of live in the midst of your doubt and in the midst of your messiness and embrace it. And as a minister, I say, look, doubts are normal. We all go through them, um, but don't remain in your doubt. It, let's try to work through your doubt and see what, what, what are the underlying principles of that doubt and abide by another pastor. I love it. He says, why are you trusting your doubts more than what you believed was the truth? Always doubt your doubts, you know? Yeah. Because it's all about me. It's about me. And that's it. That's one of the underlying all presumptions. About me. Yeah. So let's explore that because I don't want you to remain there. But there's a branch 
there's a, a stream growing into a river <laughs> in a lot of evangelical teaching that's hitting kind of the younger generation that it's okay to just live in the messiness because God loves you anyway. And there's a hint of truth in that, right? God loves you anyway. But to live in the messiness implies that Jesus wasn't clear when he spoke to us, and he wants you to just kind of just believe and do your best to follow him. That's all. Ugh. And that just leads to goofy theology. Um, so when Paul speaks in very direct terms, that, that flies in the face of uh, some of the, the teaching. So we're seeing apostasy. Are we seeing um, a large-scale apostasy? This is where I want to be careful and make sure that we're not seeing things through our local lens only. In other words, I'm seeing over the past hundreds of years, but, but certainly since the Enlightenment, um, we've seen Western culture move further and further and further away from God. But at the same time, we're seeing the global South and the East explode in terms of people coming to know Christ. Now, teaching needs to happen there, uh, but, um, but uh, Roger will certainly, I think, tell us plenty of wonderful stories about some of the stuff he experienced just in South America, uh, let alone in Africa um, and, and uh, again, in China and North Korea. We don't know the numbers there, but it's, the church is growing. So uh, it's growing, but there's apostasy. I think there will be flare-ups until there is a fire. And Paul's referring to the fire. So if what we're seeing on a regional scale is disheartening and frightening, Paul says it actually does get worse. It does get worse. Now, does the Antichrist bring on the apostasy, or the apostasy, is that the context out of which he arises? We don't know, but it's going to be one of the two. He then talks about this man of lawlessness. Um, it is the word lawless. It's, it's anomia. Uh, namas is the Greek word for law. Az is the prefix um, without or no, and so no law. Um, and so man of sin works. Even as Dr. Riddlebarger said, he, though he, he prefers man of lawlessness, but his book's called Man of Sin because I think it was Baker that, that published it. They thought man of lawlessness, it didn't sound good when you sold it. It just wasn't, it didn't catch you. Man of sin, that's going to catch the audience. So he's like, whatever. You know, it's the same idea, but, um, but technically it's lawlessness. And so the one thing that must happen before the Lord returns is the revelation of this person. In contrast to the preterist and the historicist interpretation, as something that's already occurred. There are a number of reasons why Paul is likely referring to this future apostasy throughout the worldwide church and Antichrist's influence in the church, which is the inaugurated end time temple of God. In other words, Paul is not speaking of the temple in Jerusalem, um, uh, either the one that was destroyed or a rebuilt one. He's instead using the temple as a metaphor for the church, since the church is now indwelt by the Spirit of God in this present age. It's important to note that Paul says the lawless one will be revealed, apocalypsis. Uh, and the Greek word for revelation, the book of Revelation, is the apocalypse, right? Um, so it's language that seems to make this lawless one a counterfeit redeemer with a counterfeit unveiling. The same verb, for example, is used by Paul of Jesus in the previous chapter. He will be apocalypsis. And is used again in this chapter in reference to the coming of the man of sin, the revelation of the man of lawlessness mocks the revelation of Christ. The man of sin is a counterfeit. He's a usurper. This fits with the counterfeit trinity in the book of Revelation. We'll look at this next week, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, which mimics our Lord's death, resurrection, and second advent in the beast who was, who is, and who will come again only to be judged and destroyed by Christ. So this man of lawlessness, the work of this counterfeit trinity, and again, I'll save next week, to reveal whether I think the beast is the Antichrist, could be, could not be. Um, but either way, these entities are mimicking Christ, they're mocking Christ, false miracles, um, even um, uh, a death, resurrection, and a second coming of the beast. All of this is to, co to continue to dupe people uh, in the end so that as many do not become Christians as, as um, is within their power. In Paul's discussion of this individual, there's what's called an echo from Daniel 11, 31, 36, and 12. Um, an echo is um, when there's a reference 
given uh, to, to an Old Testament text without the apostle giving uh, a direct citation. So if you go, oh my gosh, that cl he's clearly referring to the Exodus minute, there. Set that up again. So an echo yeah. is when a New Testament writer is clearly referring to an Old Testament event, yeah. but he doesn't actually cite that chapter and verse. Verse is a citation where he does cite it. Um, and so uh, you'll see that quite a bit with the Exodus, where you go, all right, clearly the Exodus is informing what he's speaking of here. That's called an echo. But if he cites it, then it's a citation. All right, same idea. Um, there's an echo from Daniel 11 in Paul's discussion that we're looking at. That is, the prophet Daniel in Daniel 11 foresees a time in the future when the daily sacrifice will cease and God's temple will be desecrated. In Daniel 11, 30 to 45, the prophet Daniel speaks of the final enemy of God, both deceiving the people of God, there's your apostasy, and causing them to forsake the covenant. All right, so when you forsake God's covenant, that is apostasy. Very likely, this means that Daniel foretells three different events. One associated first with the coming of Antiochus Epiphanes, and we looked at that. Um, another tied to the Messianic Age and the destruction of the Jerusalem Temple. And then finally to an end times profanation of the holy place by the archfoe of Israel's Messiah. So this is called telescoping. Prophecy in the Old Testament when we think of prophecy, we often think of the way Nostradamus is said to have worked. A direct prediction, and there's only one direct fulfillment. And therefore, it's either right or it's wrong. But in Old Testament prophecy, sometimes you have multiple layers of fulfillment until the final uh, fulfillment comes. So some call it telescoping, where there are kind of layers. You see this distant Thing, but you don't realize that there may be uh, uh, various uh, layers in between. I, I like the image of a cup. There's an initial, there's usually an initial fulfillment, but it's just pouring a little bit of water into the cup. So a virgin will give birth, or will conceive and give birth to a child. Well, um, it can also, virgin can also mean young girl in the Hebrew. And uh, wouldn't you know uh, that the king's daughter um, uh, did have a child, or that the king, uh, his wife did have a child, and, uh, the, and the young woman did conceive. Well, there's the initial fulfillment. A seed will come. Eve had a child. Hey, this is, this, Abel's my son, or Seth, you know, uh, is my son. Um, nope, that's an initial fulfillment, but that's not the final fulfillment. That's just a placeholder. And then there may be another one that comes along, and another one that comes along, until finally the fulfillment of all that comes along, and the cup is now filled full, right? So... Daniel talks about this end times foe. Oh, it's happening. AD 167, right? Uh, that could be him. Nope. Turns out that was just more water in the cup. Oh, come on. The temple just went down. This is it. Even then, that's just more water in the cup. Paul says, don't forget those things. They're placeholders. They're there to remind you of what's coming. And it's going to be worse. Oh, okay. So, Daniel's prophecy is clearly in Paul's mind when he speaks of an apostasy in the man of lawlessness. That's the echo. But Daniel assigns this particular figure to the time of the end. This would certainly seem to indicate that Paul is not speaking of the events of AD 70, but um, of this final day of judgment. Since this man of lawlessness sets himself up in God's temple, an act that implies the exercise of great authority, and then proclaims himself to be God, Many take this to mean that Paul is speaking of the Jerusalem temple. But as we've seen, preterists tie this to the events associated with the Jewish rejection of the gospel and the desecration of the Jewish temple. While many futurists, dispensationalists, see this as a prophecy of a rebuilt temple. Historicists are surely on the right track when they argue that the reference to the temple is a reference to the church. This identification explains why they, why they identified the man of sin with the papacy. Although... He agrees with the temple being the church. He says that he doesn't think that it's going to be the papacy in the end, but then he picks up here. As Beal points out, the Greek word temple is not on, right? Not on. It's found nine other times in the New Testament outside of 2 Thessalonians, where it is almost always used for Christ or the church. In five other times, Paul uses the word. It does not refer to a literal temple in Israel, past or future. 
In both Matthew and John, the word is used of the temple that will be destroyed before Christ raises it up, or of the true temple, and there Christ is referring to his body. Paul refers to believers as constituting the temple of God because they are in union with Christ through faith. Furthermore, in 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul depicts Christians in a manner that parallels the passage in 1 Corinthians 6, although the word temple is not specifically used. Paul is making the point that the people of God constitute the dwelling of God's spirit. In Revelation 11, the saints are pictured as a sanctuary. In Revelation 13, the beast attacks the people of God, described as the tabernacle. Taken together, this is strong evidence in favor of the view that Paul is not referring to the Jerusalem temple, but to the church. And then I just want to read this. Christ's people are now his temple, indwelt by his spirit. This can be seen on the day of Pentecost, the outpouring of the spirit in Acts chapter 2 is the reality that is foreshadowed by the Spirit filling the tabernacle in Exodus chapter 40. Third, both national Israel as the covenant community and the temple as the place of sacrifice have come to an end. When Christ died upon the cross, the veil in the Jerusalem temple was torn from top to bottom. The temple is now Ichabod. Its glory has departed. No believers are present there. Neither is God's Spirit. And so... You have this man of lawlessness, and let me just kind of bring this to an end. I'm not going to read all that. Don't worry. Um, you have this man of lawlessness who will appear. And when you think back to the Old Testament themes, somehow, as the composite picture is still being painted, he will definitely be of the ungodly line of Satan. There's no question there. He will... Um, uh, seem to come into the temple of God, which if this interpretation is correct, um, then that means he's going to be from within the church or have something to do with the church's teachings. One of the reasons I'm very convinced of that argument is because of all the warnings of keeping doctrine pure and watching out for false teachers. Paul Jesus, they had no shortage of reasons to attack the ungodliness of Rome as, as a political system, of you know the various leaders over them, and the old, if you go back to the Old Testament community, but you don't see them railing against that. Oh, if we could only vote in another king, then God's kingdom would come. They are worried, let the state be the state. We, right now, in, in scripture at least, we need to focus on pure doctrine, and we need to always be aware of the false teachers and false teaching that comes in. Our, our energy has to be spent on that. So I'm not surprised when I'm led to believe that the, um, the man of lawlessness will be one who comes into or somehow emerges from the church. That's right in line with the lowercase antichrist that John's talking about. They went out from us. So he also, though, seems to be able to, um, and we'll look at this more next week, he has great power that seems to be aligned with the state. And now I'm, I'm jumping ahead a bit to next week. So you think of Nebuchadnezzar, you think of Nimrod, you think of Pharaoh. To a lesser degree, Antiochus. Um, to Titus, as he is sent by Rome, you think of Nero, you think of all these people. Now, Nero never claimed to be a Christian, but... What you do is you have state-sponsored persecution through a figurehead who um, uh, somehow, in some way, is aligned with the church. And again, I go back to what I finished with last week. Think of modern-day China or Russia, what's happening there. And I... Told you last week briefly, I don't think Gog and Magog refer to Russia. I'm just saying what's happening there, where you have Russian Orthodox Church partnering with Putin. You have the three self church, a sham church, the official communist church. You can go to church as long as you go there, right? Um, both of them, both of the churches have the state's power, even militaristic power behind them. Who is being silenced in both cases? Many minority religious groups, but specifically within the Christian family, quote unquote. Uh, the, the evangelical church, especially in China, is going to teach a very different gospel, and in, in Russia as well, than, um, than Putin's you know, Russian Orthodox Church. 
And you're now being silenced in Russia as an evangelical. You're very much being silenced in China. Picture that on a global scale. So there I'm not saying it is Russia or China. I'm just saying there are two examples of what we can look forward to, quote unquote. And, um, and that will happen. To wrap it up, I'm just going to give you the answer. The restrainer um, seems to be seems to be a combination of, of things that we just don't know. Uh, the revela or the angel of revelation is mentioned um, uh, through the preaching of, of the gospel seems to be an incredible restrainer. Satan is bound. Um, even uh, when you get to Revelation 20, he's bound, and it's it's here on the next page. Um, but the word um, the word bound uh, is is uh, is in there, and it's the same word that Jesus used when he bound the strong man to release those oppressed by Satan. So Satan is bound through what? Through the proper teaching, the very opposite of apostasy, the proper teaching of God's word through the church, by the power of the Spirit, under the providence of God. But at some point, God will make it very difficult to have the gospel go out, probably through immense persecution, and hell like we haven't seen it before, in terms of oppressing the people of God, will be unleashed. And Paul says, because that hasn't happened yet, on a global scale, then the second coming has not happened, but I want you to be prepared, because there's no, I think, no hint in scripture that uh, you will be raptured away before that. In fact, what does Jesus always prepare us for? Persecution. All who seek to lead a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So, for a very personal, practical reason, as a pastor, I think we need to prepare each other for that, that day. Whether we're facing the lower K Antichrist and being persecuted, or if the Lord has us here at the time of his coming, and we have to go through global persecution, whatever it is, we need to stand in the midst of it and not be those who were a part of us but then went out from us. So, know our doctrine. I got five minutes. I'll take five minutes of, of questions. I know it's a lot, but that's Second Thessalonians. Yeah? I was, I've been playing around with this idea um, that sometimes the, the most potent antichrists are the ones that um, um, offer the church protection from the thing that they fear the most. Mm. So I was thinking about um, like Germany in, in, 19, in the 1930s. Communism was a very real threat yes. to the church at the time. And what ended up happening was actually it wasn't communism that was the greatest threat. It was the church's willingness to go along with a strong strong man to protect them from the thing that they feared the most. Yes, yes, yes. And so um, I'm wondering if if like our biggest blind spot is not necessarily the, the stuff on the left, but the stuff coming from the right in, 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 in our church. Preach so. it. Uh, uh, what's, what's being called Christian nationalism or something like that. Yeah. Yes. Which is why I'm, I'm you know, maybe a, a different topic for a different day. Well, it certainly is at this point, but I'm not, I'm by and large not a fan of um, the culture wars. Um, doesn't mean that I don't line, of course I want abortion to end. We talked about that a little bit last week. Sure. And I, I, yes, you know, as an American citizen, I'm going to try to exercise my rights as a citizen to help change some things, you know, whatever I can do. But I want to be careful, never mind as a pastor, just as a Christian, not to equate me fighting for um, free speech with the kingdom of God. Mm. That That's where I'm, and it's hard sometimes, right, to, to yeah. separate that. But if we start to throw, you know, our theology in with, all right, God wants us to raise up whoever the next Republican candidate is, speaking of the right, you know. Sure. Um, Oh, or if you're on the left, the next Democratic candidate, or Bernie Sanders, um, you know, then that there, um, you know, equals the kingdom of God. And before you know it, we've been we've been duped because 
don't, you know, to, to think of Gandalf, don't give me the ring, Frodo. I, I, I mean to do a lot of good, but through me there would be much harm, right? You put so much power into one person, especially a political leader. Um, that is a problem. I think it's a major problem here. It, it flows out of, it's in our culture, it's in our DNA as Americans specifically, with Manifest Destiny still hanging in there. Um, so it's stuff we do. We do have to worry about it. And I, I'll close by saying you're, you're spot on about, about Nazi Germany. Um, in one of his lectures, Riddlebarger talks about, in, in a class like this, he started off by showing old Nazi propaganda. And he said he could just hear the gasp, and it is. It's shocking when you see little kids with the swastika on top of the Christmas tree singing songs to our savior Hitler. But this was propaganda being used to teach them the Reich, which was supposed to last, what? Oh, a thousand years, direct millennial tie there. Didn't last a thousand years, obviously. But, you know, this is your savior. Picture that on a global scale. And we see what he did to the, to the underground church. Just read the, doc, or the biography of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Let me close this in prayer. Lord, thank you um, for preparing us. And uh, we know that uh, brothers and sisters have slightly different interpretations on uh, various uh, um, uh, topics, timeline, etc. We all want to be um, found ready, but we want to be found faithful, Lord. And, and uh, one, of, one of my concerns is that some people are just getting, they're not really being prepared to persevere uh, through some very difficult times because they think that they'll just be swept out. Um, and Lord, uh, we, we want to learn from our brothers and sisters across the globe who are already facing uh, the hand um, of, uh, of the Antichrist in, in so many ways and the hand of Satan upon them where they're, they're in danger every single day. Let us learn to be faithful like them so that when that day comes for us, should it come for us, we will be found ready so that you may get the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you. And I guess we can let them have their tea.